Hey, what's going on, everybody? Strong Dad here. I have gotten a lot of requests to do a reaction to this video, to this band. Now, I feel kind of bad and kind of guilty that I have never listened to this band, Sabaton. I've heard a lot about them, but I've kind of been under a rock. Uh, and that has to do with, you know, raising my kids and being extremely busy with my career, um, where it definitely put me in a little bubble when it came to the good music that was out there. So. I'm taking your advice. Uh, probably about a dozen people have requested that I do a video. This is going to be Sabaton Inmate 4859. Uh, I This is first time for me. Um, but what a few of you recommended is that I do a reaction to the song itself and then I guess there's a commentary that someone made about Inmate 4859 that the song is about. So a little bit of warning in advance. This is probably going to be a little bit longer video. Um, but. I probably won't stop it that much. It was recommended that instead of doing the actual band video at the beginning of this, that I do the lyric video. Uh, apparently, uh, some reactors were having problems with the video being blocked, but I understand that, and hopefully you will too, and it would be kind of nice to go along with the lyrics of the song to get a better understanding. So buckle up, this is going to be a long one. Thanks so much. I'm going to switch over and we are going to start the reaction right now. Stop talking, Strong Dad. All right, let's go. Sabaton, inmate 4859. Cell 
wow, I kind of didn't want to stop that. <laughs> um, this brings up a lot of emotion for me. Uh, quite a few different things. Uh, number one, I have physically been to Auschwitz. Um, horrible place um, to stand in the rooms where millions were slaughtered where millions were held captive where millions died uh, yeah so uh, and my dad, he, he, uh, fought in world war two. Uh, and so some of the stories that he told, uh, about why they were fighting and what they were doing. Uh, so yeah, now, now I even feel more bad about not <laughs> knowing about Sabaton. Uh, I like this song a lot. Their storytelling is amazing, you guys. Wow. How dare I? Shame on me. Uh, their storytelling. I love, I'm a lyricist. I write lyrics. Um, and I rarely told stories in my lyrics. But I love a good lyricist and good lyrics and good storytelling. I'm right there. I can't wait to hear the rest of this. yes Woo. wow I loved that song um, now I'm excited about going to the next one to learn about inmate 4859 so let me stop jabbering here and let's go straight over to it now this uh, is a 17 minute video so we're just I'm probably not gonna leave too many comments on it um, I might here and there though but let's go ahead and start this the story of Vitold Pilecki is one of the great 20th century stories of bravery and sacrifice and our song inmate 4859 is about the brave man Vitold Pilecki this is gonna be so good
The story of Witold Pilecki is as tragic as it is heroic, and it is one for the ages. He was born in the Russian Empire, near the Finnish border in 1901, spent his youth as part of the nationalistic Polish Pathfinders, and fought in independent Poland's new army against the Soviets in the Polish-Soviet War. Hmm. He lived a peaceful life for much of the interwar years, but eventually returned to the Army Reserve and in 1939 was mobilized against the German invasion. Hmm. Pilecki's Ulan Regiment was shattered by the advancing Wehrmacht, but he joined other Polish stragglers and kept fighting until the fall of Warsaw. In late October, he disappeared into the underground, where he joined the resistance movement of the Taina Armia Polska, an arm of the Armia Krajowa, the Polish Home Army. Now, one of their tasks was to get inside knowledge about German prisoner of war camps, and one camp in particular in the small town of Oswiecim, Auschwitz in German, where many Poles simply disappeared. It was suspected that they were sent to Germany as forced labor, but no one knew for sure. Pilecki came up with a dangerous plan. He would personally infiltrate Auschwitz, uncover the truth, and organize resistance in the camp. On wow. September 19, 1940, using the alias Tomasz Serafinski, he intentionally walked into a German security sweep on the streets of Warsaw. SS men seized him, and the next day he was herded alongside other Poles into trucks at the Warsaw train station. All day they drove east, the men pressed together without food or water. Now, the rest of this story is told directly from the source material, from Pilecki's personal report about his experiences in the camp. It is not pretty. Oh, no. Arriving at the camp, Pilecki and the crowd of men were driven forward by brutal beatings from the guards. Some men were pulled out of the group at random, unprovoked, and shot in the head to break any thoughts of resistance. Accompanied by the laughter of the guards, they were then pushed on past the barbed wire and towards the parade ground, where a group of men in striped clothes was waiting for them. These men jumped the newcomers with fists and clubs. Some were actually beaten to death. The men in the striped clothes then asked them questions about their backgrounds and their jobs. And those who said uh, academics or doctors were knocked to the ground. With boots kicking against their heads, their murderers proclaimed that this is the concentration camp Auschwitz, my good man. His head shaved, Pilecki hurried out of the bathhouse, though a guardsman knocked out two of his front teeth because he did not hold the sign with his prison number between them. From now on, Pilecki was neither himself nor Tomasz, but a number, prisoner 4859. In his paper-thin blue and white striped uniform and a pair of ill-fitting wooden shoes, he found himself once again on the parade ground. There, he encountered the murderous men again. They were called capos, prisoner functionaries. Often German or Polish criminals, they were tasked with, let's say, keeping things in line inside the camp, since the regular SS men lived in barracks outside, right? Most of the capos were violent sadists who enjoyed brutally beating and torturing the helpless prisoners. Wearing yellow armbands with the capo label, they also oversaw the labor companies, to one of which Pilecki was assigned. In that labor company, it became clear that Auschwitz aimed to first exterminate the Polish intelligentsia. Prisoners with academic backgrounds who were not used to demanding physical work or who, who lacked the experience or the dexterity to work in the quarries were mercilessly beaten to death by the capos. Being too exhausted to lift another brick or, or to push a wheelbarrow was also a death sentence. Every evening, fewer people returned to the main camp. Every walk to the latrines, every trip to the bathhouse was accompanied by beatings and harassment. Those who came late to morning parade or, or tried to hide away were hunted down, dragged to the parade ground, and either hanged or shot in front of the others. Many tried to kill themselves, usually early in the morning before the day of torture began. If anyone tried to escape, the whole block was punished for it, standing out in the open for hours or, or doing punishment sports where men too exhausted to lift their arms fell down and died under the boots of the capos. Hmm. Often, the only time to catch your breath was when they were busy murdering another prisoner. Pilecki's good physical condition saved him from this fate, but for how long could that last? Well, Pilecki set out to build his first resistance cell, a group of five men. 
Later, he would create other Fiverr groups, but none of them knew of the existence of the others. So in case they were captured and tortured, they could not betray the whole network, right? Those groups would either organize food or clothing or would help other members to get a, a job since it was clear from day one that staying in the worker groups, the labor groups, even well-conditioned men like Poletsky would soon die. So many of those worker prisoners did in fact die that the prisoners had to build the first camp crematorium. Poletsky noted that the camp became one big mill which ground living people to ash. In 1941, as more and more prisoners were brought in, the camp grew. Larger fences were needed, more barbed wire and more guard towers. And as Auschwitz grew, it needed to feed itself. And this opened up jobs for the older prisoners. With careful planning, Pilecki got his Fiverr groups into the carpenters, the postal service, and the barbers. He eventually got himself a job as a repairman for an oven inside an SS man's house outside the camp. Upon leaving the living hell of Auschwitz, he returned to a world of, of lavish gardens, laughing children at play, and villagers having normal everyday conversations with one another. Polensky felt the questions burning inside him. What was the real world? What, what was the real nature of man? What was the culture of the 20th century? Since mankind had advanced so far from the barbarism of old, how is this still possible? Or, or was this the true face of humanity? Would the whole world look like this if the boundaries of civilization disappeared? Each morning, he and the other prisoners found themselves surprised to be alive. Their bodies thin to the bone, black and blue from the daily beatings, riddled with lice and fleas, living on a starvation diet, only his daily mantra, you're not giving up, helped Pilecki keep on and try to inspire others to do the same. Survival was only possible through friendship and mutual help. Loners died quick. Now, up until May 1941, it was possible for... Sorry, I've got to stop just a little bit here. Uh, you know, nowadays we have heroes, sports stars, football stars, basketball. Those, those aren't heroes. Those are really good athletes. Poletsky, that is a hero. He volunteered for this. He probably didn't know what he was getting into, but regardless, he volunteered for this. Wow. I had to stop just a little bit to gather myself, <sighs> but I'm back. For ordinary Poles to be released from Auschwitz, mostly by their families paying enormous sums to the Germans. Those released prisoners smuggled Poletsky's notes to the army at Krajowa. But when the war between Germany and the Soviet Union began, this stopped. Instead, new groups began arriving to the camp. Many were now Jews, and by the end of August, the first Soviet prisoners were transported to Auschwitz. Poletsky reports that one day, 700 officers were tightly packed into a room all day, till finally a group of German soldiers with gas masks on threw gas containers inside. This was the first act of gassing people with hydrogen cyanide at Auschwitz, according to Poletsky. Soon after, though, on his way to work, he passed groups of naked Soviet prisoners waiting to be led into the crematorium where they were gassed and burned. The capos were often brutal savages, but the bestiality of some of the SS guards was even worse. Pilecki tells of guard dogs trained to go for the throats of prisoners, the torture of smashing testicles with a hammer, and many stories far too nightmarish to tell here. Now with his cells set up in important positions all over the camp, Pilecki was ready to start a revolt, but he needed help from the outside to be successful. The prisoners were thirsty for revenge, and they were ready for anything since 
they did not fear death after all they had endured. But even had they managed to overwhelm the guards and take the camp, they would not be able to hold it for long. Pilecki believed that the Armia Krajowa had received at least one of his messages. He had urged them to stage an attack or, or, or send in paratroopers from the Free Polish Army over in Britain or, or drop a crate of arms onto them or something. But so far, nothing. Without help from the outside, Pilecki's third Christmas in Auschwitz came and went. And Auschwitz was now changing. There was no longer collective punishment, no outright murder or even everyday brutality, or at least it was toned down. See, Auschwitz became a factory which would now systematically murder its prisoners instead of individualistic random killing. Not with the batons of the capos, but with phenol and gas. There were three crematoriums working simultaneously, able to burn corpses within minutes. By April 1943, more and more of the surviving Poles. <clears throat> to stand in those actual rooms, those actual rooms, and the pictures of that room with the body stacked up halfway up, almost to the ceiling. Humankind can suck sometimes. Whew. We're sent out of Auschwitz to make room for Jewish prisoners from all over Europe and the Soviet Union. This meant the end of Pilecki's network as its members were sent to other camps. So after two years and seven months of surviving in Auschwitz, Pilecki decided it was time to break out since an uprising was no longer possible. He got a night shift job at a bakery outside the camp. Shortly after Easter, as one guard was asleep, he and two other men pushed the door open and ran. Shots cracked out behind them, but they ran all night and all day until they reached a small town. With help from patriotic Poles, Pilecki smuggled himself back to Warsaw, where, on August 23, 1943, after nearly a thousand days in Auschwitz, he met with commanders of the Armia Krajowa, telling them of his experiences, all the death, all the torture, but people hesitated to believe him. It seemed all too unbelievable, even for, even for the hated Germans to do all this killing. They knew it was bad, but not this bad. Pilecki would stay in the underground army and fight in the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. He was later interned in prisoner of war camps and after liberation in 1945 was assigned to the second corps of the Polish army in Italy, where he turned in his report about Auschwitz to the British. For Pilecki, Auschwitz was the symbol of the Polish struggle for existence. He himself could never go back to a normal civilian life after experiencing what you've just heard. He maintained contact with the underground resistance, now against the Soviet Union, after the war, and indeed returned to Poland in late 1945 to report on the Soviet occupation. He lived and worked undercover, but on May the 8th, 1947, the Ministry of Public Security captured him. He was tortured and dragged before a kangaroo court and accused of, well, accused of many things, including espionage and planning an armed uprising, the sentence was death. On May 25, 1948, in the Mokotov prison in Warsaw, Witold Pilecki was executed. His final resting place remains unknown. In 1990, Pilecki and others from that show trial were rehabilitated, and today he is celebrated, and with good reason, as a Polish patriot and a hero. Now, we cannot even imagine what he went through and what courage it must have taken to do so. It's a pretty heavy story, you know? Yeah, uh, I gotta be honest, over, I don't know how many people we researched for the Heroes album, but 
if there ever was a slam dunk, you know, part of my language, what the fuck moment, mm. this was it, I would say. And it is, you know, they're, they're, sacrifice is one thing, bravery is another thing, but doing all of that, I mean, think of the odds. I mean, getting in and getting out. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go <laughs> to Auschwitz on purpose. And then I'm going to get out yeah. on purpose and doing all that for a cause <laughs> and for what is essentially, what is a noble and a just cause, any way you slice it. Yeah. And you know? I, I mean, I am so surprised also that how isn't there a major Hollywood blockbuster about this? Seriously. That makes no sense at all. Yeah, it's, and people are coming up with, you know, Hollywood scripts. I mean, I'm not bashing the film industry here, don't get me wrong. But I mean, people are making scripts that are less fantastic and not true and still nobody... And this is a true this. story. And it's, even the tragic ending and stuff, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, Maybe that's why they're not doing it. Yeah. Well, they could throw in our like a romantic interest yeah. or something. They can have Gwyneth Paltrow, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Romance in Auschwitz, great. <laughs> oh, jeez. Stranger things have happened in Hollywood. Yes, true. You know, but that leads you to wonder. I mean, you, there must have been romantic stories in, in Auschwitz. I, I guess so. I mean, we met a woman called Anna who fought in the Polish resistance okay. during the uprising. Yeah. She actually said that, yeah, there was, well, she was flirting with a guy in the middle of, you know, I mean, not as they were shooting, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, but, but, uh, I mean, but that's only, that's not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Exactly. So, I mean, she said it's um, strange how, how man, or, you know, you can normalize such a extreme mm. situation For and seven. life still goes on. You still go to the toilet, everybody understands that, but you are still actually falling in love while fighting or waging a war, you know. Weird. And if this guy could break out, then of course you could break from the men's side to the women's side. Yeah. You know, it's nothing. I mean, if there's one thing this all proves is nothing is impossible. <laughs> nothing is as impossible as you think. No, but it is. It's, you know, what would even more than just a Hollywood movie, it'd be a good miniseries. Yes. <laughs> you know, actually, HBO, do you hear this? See, if anybody out there's HBO is listening, and Yuki and I'll write it. I mean, I'm a writer, and he's he's good at emotion, so together we could we could do it. Yeah, but don't put me in, in, in acting in it because I suck as an actor. As we've noticed over these months of yes. Sabaton history. <laughs> you know. um, what about the actual song itself, though? Uh, did did you decide on the the topic before you wrote the song, or did you have the music sitting around and, and uh, wrote the music with Peter, our producer? Uh -huh. uh, okay. The first time we wrote a song together. And uh, him, you know, coming from, you know, Lindemann, Payne, Hypocrisy, those bands, and the harder side of things, uh, it became a bit of a harder and very, very dark song. So okay. as we were writing that song, I realized that this is the song. Because yeah. obviously, even though it's a very, very, you know, we're singing about a very courageous man, it would not have made sense at all to have a, you know, proud, uplifting song yeah. to the subject, so, you know. especially, Yeah, I wonder yeah. what he was like as a person, like personality-wise, because you don't, I mean, from the story, you can see, okay, he's got a lot of dedication, but you can meet someone on the street, you don't know if they're a dedicated type person or not, no, you know? No. So it would be, um, it would be really interesting. Well, uh, that's your homework, guys, to, uh, to go and uh, put the song on and think of Vitold Kolecki. That's all for today. Thank you very much. See you next time. Wow. Wow. So many, so many questions. Uh, wow. To escape Auschwitz and then to be sentenced by your own to death. And now to be reveled as a hero. Yeah, why isn't there a stinking movie about this? Netflix, HBO. Come on. <laughs> but thanks to Sabaton for bringing stories like this and heroes like this to light. Uh, you know, in my past, I mean, my background, my heritage is German, uh, like 80%. Uh, so... This stuff, you know, this stuff is heavy, heavy duty to watch for me, for being there in Auschwitz, for being in some of the concentration camps in Germany. Um, 
you know and something that the singer I, I imagine that's a singer for Sabaton something that he said about the person that he was talking to you know maybe having a fling with one of the uh, German soldiers in the concentration camp and how it's like in the midst of all that horror you know in a horrific way that was happening it kind of reminded me of you know that childish gambino song that got really popular um this is america uh you know and i mean i'm american i and i'm proud to be an american but i sure am not proud of what happened and what happens in america i mean you guys see it all in the news. You guys that aren't Americans, you see it. The shootings, the mass murders, the school shootings. But yet, all people are worried about is, you know, the latest fashion, the latest trends, the latest sports. This is America, you know. When the world is burning, we're just out there dancing on the dead bodies. Yeah. I personally, when I was younger, I remember having huge debates with people who were family at the time that were claiming that the Holocaust was fake. Now imagine me being in Auschwitz, seeing what I saw, coming back and talking trying to talk sensibly to people like that i loved them i love them still and from what i can tell a lot of them have changed their thinking but there are people like that out there so thanks sabaton fill me in uh i'm sorry this has been such a long video but talk about riveting talk about emotional means so much to me and people that are watching i'm sure that there are people out there that are very knowledgeable about sabaton fill me in on them i'm very intrigued now do they write the majority of their songs based on real life situations based on war because this has really kind of sparked like i said before my dad was in world war ii he fought in italy i might even do a commentary reaction video about his division this is kind of just being inspired right now in me i don't know people might not watch it but i, I want to watch it so everybody out there those that recommended this video this song whew, thank you thank you i really enjoyed watching this and learning from this and feeling the emotions from this sometimes you need these things to be brought back up to remember what's important value life value your brother and your sister everyone out there Stay strong, be safe, and have a wonderful rest of your day, okay? Bye, everybody.